ladies and gentlemen, exactly two and a half years ago. It was on the 25th of January 2012. A grand debate began in Europe, a debate about data protection in a world of total connectivity, about privacy in a world where data flows across borders as easily as the air we breathe, about the future of the digital economy. And just over one year ago, the debate took an unexpected turn because the first stories about PRISM were published. And since then, as you very well know, the headlines have been dominated by stories about government surveillance, about handing out of personal data by companies to governments. And in my dialogue with citizens across the European Union, I sense this feeling of shock. Could this really happen in such a dimension? Historic memories of mass surveillance came to the surface again, and people started to worry, confidence waned. Now you know that data collection by companies and surveillance by governments go hand in hand. Those issues are deeply connected. The surveillance revelations involve companies whose services were all used on a daily basis. Backdoors have been opened, encryption has been weakened, concern about government surveillance has driven consumers away from digital services. Now, from a citizen's perspective, the underlying issue is the same in both cases. Data should not be kept simply because the storage is cheap. Data should not be processed simply because algorithms are refined. Safeguards should apply, and the constitutional and the legal rights of the citizen should be preserved. Trust in a data-driven economy was already worryingly low before PRISM, and it fell even further when the first NSA slides were published. The priority now is to restore trust, and today I will speak about how this can be done with concrete steps and where Europe is standing on this. For me, the surveillance scandals have been a real wake-up call, and politicians needed to respond. The commission where I was in charge of the justice portfolio until last Monday took a firm stance. No mass surveillance is not acceptable. Yes, we have to set up measures to build trust in the EU US data flows. And three steps were of utmost importance. The first one concerns safe harbor. In November last year, the Commission, the EU government, gave a to-do list of 13 recommendations to our US counterparts. 13 ways to improve all aspects of the functioning of safe harbor. Let me put it simply, we kicked the tires and saw that the repairs were necessary. And for Safe Harbor fully to be roadworthy, the US will have to service it. Safe Harbor has to be strengthened comprehensively or suspended. And the Parliament has already asked three times to the European Commission to suspend Safe Harbor. I refrain from doing this at this moment for the simple reason that it would not only hurt American companies, it would hurt European companies alike. Since the discussions began, 12 of the 13 points on the to-do list were rather near to um, finding a solution. The outstanding recommendation relates to the national security exemption. And at present, Safe Harbor decisions say that data transferred under the scheme can be used, I quote, to the extent necessary to meet national security requirements. Now it is all about the 
the definition of the extent. For us Europeans, this is not a carte blanche, but a limited exception. And an exception can never become the rule. I made this clear to my American colleagues, and this essential part and this essential point must be solved in order to make safe harbor safe. And I predict that the European Parliament will never give the green light if this question has not been solved. Second point. We have to agree on strong data protection rules in the law enforcement context. We need a robust EU-US data protection agreement in the law enforcement sector, the so-called umbrella agreement, which ensures that European citizens can enforce their right when their data is processed in the US. Now let me give you an example. What if your name is identical of that to that of a suspect in a transatlantic criminal investigation? Your data accidentally gets collected and included on a US blacklist, then you should be able to have it deleted by the authorities, if necessary, by a judge once the mistake is discovered. Americans have those rights in the European Union. Europeans should get the same rights when their data is exchanged with the US. Again, we have made progress in our negotiations, but a crucial part of the puzzle is not yet in place. The US recognizes that the issue of judicial redress is essential for EU citizens. At the EU-US Justice Ministerial last week, the Obama administration committed to seeking legislative action to give Europeans legal certainty in the US. This is a very welcome step. It opens the door towards closing a deal. But I made it also very clear. There will not be a deal on promises. There will be a deal on law on an, and on implementation of this law. So let's wait for the Congress. Third. We must ensure that European concerns are addressed in the reform of the US surveillance programs. Now, President Obama made a very important speech last January, uh, where he showed into this direction. And he recognized at that moment that the current data collection programs go too far. On the legislative side, the initial draft of the USA Freedom Act, as it, as it is called now, would have had indirect benefits for the EU citizens. So we could have lived with this. Unfortunately, the House of Representatives did a lot of damage to the initial text. Now it is up to the Senate to put freedom back into the US Freedom Act. Sine qua non. Together with our US counterparts, we have done what partners should do, not spying on each other, but speaking to each other, talking to each other, negotiating with each other. There is now time for delivery on safe harbor and on the umbrella agreement. The, EU's, US re, the EU's requests are reasonable. We want a national security exception in a commercial agreement to remain an exception and not to become a rule. We want the rights of judicial redress for Europeans in the US on the same uh, level as the Americans have a right to redress in the European Union. There is still a window of opportunity for the US to deliver, but time is really running out. And the US has to act now, it has to prove to the Europeans that it can be trusted. Because what I try to do, to keep all this stuff out of the TTIP discussions, doesn't work anymore. Because we didn't finish in time. Because the Americans didn't give us the last mile in order to finish our agreements. Now the danger is that this non-trust and this whole discussions will go 
into the transatlantic agreement uh, discussions. And this would not be very good because that would mean uh, putting a weight on what is already very difficult now. And that is why restoring trust must be first on our agenda because this trust runs very low. Trust not in the administration. Trust not in private enterprises. Do you know that 92% of the Europeans are concerned about the mobile apps collecting their data without their consent? 89% of European people say they want to know when the data on their smartphone is being shared with a third party. Why are those figures so poor? Well, if you see what is going on and this latest bizarre and rather disturbing experiment to change people's mood certainly doesn't uh, make things better, uh, but the problem is more profound. Citizens know that companies use their personal data in ways they cannot control. Now I know, some say this is simply because the individual's knowledge is overtaken by the technological change. But what if it is not? What if you have there a citizen who understands, who disagrees, but cannot act? Let's take a very simple example. What happens when a citizen wants to play a game on a tablet? He or she has to pay for the app, but doesn't want personal data, for instance, location data, to be collected. Often the rule is take it or leave it. And that is at that moment when trust evaporates. That's when people feel forced to part with their privacy. We have, put individuals back in, we have to put back individuals in control by updating their rights. Explicit consent, right to be forgotten, the right to data portability, the right to be informed of personal data breaches are basic elements. And they will help, if implemented, close the growing rift between citizens and the companies with which they share their data willingly or otherwise. And people should see that their rights are enforced in a meaningful way. Take the change of Google's privacy policy, decided in March 2012. Now, several national data protection authorities found that this does not comply with existing European and national law. Google has been sanctioned in two countries, has been sanctioned in Spain, 900,000 uh, euros uh, fine. It has been sanctioned in France, maximum fine of 150,000 euros. Now, uh, what does that mean? That means in the term of Google's turnover 2012, 0.0003%. That's potted money. That is laughable. And that is not surprising that people do not take the rules serious anymore. And it is not surprising that Google does not amend, amend its privacy policy. And that is why the data protection reform, which is underway, introduces stiff sanctions that can reach as much as 2% of the global annual turnover of a company. In the case I have just explained, that would mean a 731 million fine. Um, if, it, uh, if this analogy was put in place. And that will make companies to reflect if they implement law or if they just ignore law. Now, the European Parliament has understood this perfectly well. It has, with an overwhelming uh, majority, voted for these new rules to be put in place. After a lot of hesitation, I must say that the ministers of the 28 member states also start to be in track, on track, the work in the Council uh, has slowly picked uh, up pace, and the Greek Mediterranean a real uh, president, uh, the Greek presidency, a real Mediterranean success story, achieved a partial general approach at the Council last month. So you see, you might not know that, but this Greek presidency has, in the working groups of the ministers, done a very good uh, job. 
And then we have the European Court of Justice, our neighbor here. It has given a real helping hand with very strong, explicit rulings. With a ruling saying, yes, the right to be forgotten applies. Yes, digital self-determination is a constitutional right. Yes, the European law and the Charter of Fundamental Rights, something like Europe's Bill of Rights, apply to all companies, be they European, be they American, be they Chinese, when they act uh, on, operate on the EU territory. And this ruling has brought Larry Page to declare in a Financial Times interview, Google now bows to the EU rule. It needed a decision of the court. Law was not enough. Well, if it will take every time a decision of the court, I can predict you something, because I have been See, looking at during the last five years how this court works. And I warn all those who think they can bypass the European law. The European Court of Justice not only applies the European law, but it has started also to apply the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is part of the European treaties. In this context, Rebuilding trust, applying the law. Europe has, of course, also to do its homework because we are far from being perfect. I give you an example on the EU's data retention directive, a legislation which had been done a la va vite after 9-11 between behind closed doors without a real uh, public uh, debate. Um, the European Court of Justice recently said loud out what many of us have been thinking silently. Data is kept for too long, is too easily accessed, and the risk of abuse is too great. So what did the court do? It scrapped the law. Well done. But it did not scrap the law without saying that there are no alternatives. And it made something very clear. It made very clear that you cannot have rights without security, but you cannot have security without rights. The two are the same, are the two parts of the same uh, coin. And I'm very grateful to the court to have said this very explicitly, because that will bring the European lawmakers in the future to seek for this equilibrium and to seek that there are no security measures without taking into consideration the rights of the individual. And when we do that on our soil, ladies and gentlemen, we can exercise worldwide some impact. Europe is the biggest economy in the world. Look at facts and figures, not what you read in some press. And our single market, is a gold mine for companies big and small. And the trust of the consumers in a respectful fair treatment by the companies they entrust their personal data to is a bankable good. Look what has happened to the American cloud computing in uh, companies, the cloud um, industries after um, the uh, revelations. Well, the lost trust has led to a very strong lost income. Experts have calculated losses up to 35 billion euros until 2016, because simply people do not entrust any more their data to American clouds. So, ladies and gentlemen, trust is bankable. And successful new business models will have inbuilt trust-stimulating system. So it is worthwhile to invest in a very proactive, constructive way in these business models with inbuilt trust systems. And it is very un... It's not efficient. And it is lost money to spend millions of dollars in reactive lobby of uh, effects which have proven to have very little impact. So. People around here, 
the young ones, those who want to build a company, take into consideration that technology changes the world, technology changes the people, but one thing stays, the values of a society. Take those serious, build them in into your business model.